that um, I'm going to spend, I'm going to spend most of the time today uh, talking about solutions to plastic pollution, solutions to marine debris. Um, so thanks again for having me here today, and we'll get started. So as I mentioned, I'm going to start talking a little bit about the sources and the scope of the problem. So where does plastic pollution come from? And sometimes I'll use the word marine debris, which means our human-made waste that ends up in the oceans. It comes from people who litter from their cars. It comes from mismanagement of our solid waste, as you see here, some um, trash cans overflowing. It comes from illegal dumping. People dump tires, mattresses, construction waste uh, along the roadside and sometimes in creeks. And uh, it comes from homeless encampments, as you see there. And it also comes from people who, on purpose, release balloons into the air, which I'll talk about in a minute. So those are the land-based sources of plastic pollution. Uh, but there are also water-based sources, which include things that come from fishing, fishing nets, crab pots, um, uh, all kinds of monofilament line. They also come from vessels that are abandoned in the environment. And also, of course, tsunamis and other uh, floods, disasters can cause a lot of our uh, debris, our trash to end up in, the, in our waterways. And the reason that we focus on plastic, although some debris, of course, is made out of metal or, or paper, um, but we focus on plastic partly because it is a permanent material in most ways. It is going to be with us a very long time. This chart, that little blue person there on the left, shows a human lifespan. And you see how long some other things last, like fishing line and diapers and plastic bottles. So um, we focus on this because it's a permanent material that we're really using for temporary purposes. Uh, you know, a bottle, we just use it for 10 or 15 minutes, but it will last hundreds of years. Luckily, there's growing awareness. More and more people are becoming aware about this issue. And they're also becoming aware of the impact that our plastic debris is having in the oceans. Um, years ago, very few people had heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is a uh, it's kind of a soup of plastic debris that accumulates in a gyre in, a, in an area of the ocean. Um, but now we are quite aware that there are five of these gyres uh, in all the oceans. So uh, there's definitely growing awareness and growing concern about um, this kind of pollution. And more is coming. Back in the 1950s, when single-use cups and plates were new, um, we perhaps couldn't foresee just how prevalent these were going to be in our life. But uh, this chart shows how much new plastic is projected to be uh, produced and disposed of in the decades to come. So you see that uh, a lot more plastic is coming. And um, I really believe that we cannot recycle our way out of this issue. Um, yes, we should recycle, but we've got to do way more because um, quite honestly, we're, we're incapable of recycling at the levels that we would need to. I wanted to share with you too, this, this list, these are the top 20 debris items, trash items, that are found by volunteers during the International Coastal Cleanup in Virginia. This is actually 20 years of data that we consolidated into this list. And you see everything in yellow relates to what we eat and what we drink, bottles and cans and caps and uh, packaging for food, uh, straws, things like that. If we could eliminate litter and inappropriate mismanagement of our uh, debris that comes from what we eat and what we drink, look at how different this top 10 list would look. Now, here's the same top 10 list, but this time uh, what I've done is in yellow are the items that are plastic. It surprises some people that cigarette filters are in fact plastic. Those little white fibers are saleless acetate. Um, but you see that most of this top 10 or top 20 list is made out of plastic. 
And the orange, the items in orange are often plastic, uh, like uh, rope, uh, item number 12. Most of the rope we find uh, during our cleanups is made out of nylon, which is a plastic. Uh, balloons can be either latex, which is not a plastic, or they can be uh, foil balloons. Foil balloons are actually plastic covered with metallic paints. Uh, so you see a lot of plastic on this list. So what are some of the impacts of all this? Well, it's well documented some of the physical impacts that our debris has on wild animals, uh, including this sea turtle. And there's also uh, chemical impacts when plastics have chemicals added to them or when the plastics are out in the environment, chemicals can attach to the plastics. So there's physical and there's uh, chemical impacts. There's also ingestion. Animals ingest or eat uh, what they think is food, but in fact is not. Um, plastic bags are a real problem because they can look like jellyfish to sea turtles, and sea turtles love to eat jellyfish. Um, also, that bird in the upper left, that was a, a chick, uh, a baby chick, uh, albatross, that never left its nest, but its parents would feed it. And the parents mistook our waste, mostly as you see here, bottle caps and some cigarette lighters. Um, and so this poor chick basically starved to death with its stomach full of plastic. So uh, it's a real issue and it's solvable. Um, the bottom photo there uh, left is a Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, which is a highly endangered animal, highly endangered species. And it was found on Fisherman Island here in Virginia, uh, obviously dead, and it had two balloons, one in its uh, stomach and one in its esophagus with plastic ribbons attached. Um, so these, our debris is deadly when eaten. It's also deadly when animals become entangled in it. Um, in this case, we've got uh, plastic ribbons on balloons that were the cause of entanglement and a toy. So looking at a list of, of why does this matter? Why are we you know, concerned? We're concerned because so much of this debris is, is harmful. It's deadly to wildlife. This study from, 19, or from uh, 2016 shows some of the most deadly types of debris. And you see a lot of this is, uh, you know, again, bags, um, utensils, cups, uh, things that we um, eat and drink every day. There's the other impacts can be health. Um, what is the impact of the tiniest animals? This is a, a, a water flea. They're very tiny daphneas. Um, and those little uh, sparks of green are pieces of microplastics, micro being very, very, very small, but small enough that uh, they look like food to these uh, small animals, which are the bottom of a food chain. Um, so we know that plastic is harming marine life, and we don't know about what's happening to humans yet. Uh, other impacts include habitat and economics. For example, would you want to go to a beach that looked like that, you know, covered with plastic bottles? Uh, so towns uh, spend a lot of money um, removing debris and removing trash and litter. So there are economic costs. So that was just a real brief look. Um, at the well-documented sources of plastic pollution and some of the impacts. Um, but now let's talk about solutions. Uh, I want to point out that there are many, many, many people and companies and schools and nonprofit organizations uh, working on solutions. And most of the solutions fall into three categories, educate, innovate, legislate. And by educate or education, I am referring to behavior change. When people become aware of an issue, they become aware of what they can do to help solve that issue, um, then make a commitment to changing their behavior. So that's the role for education. Innovation is uh, when we do things differently. We make things out of different materials. For example, a few years ago, a major toy company packaged most of their toys in plastic. 
um, you know, plastic boxes with plastic uh, film on top. And a few years ago, they switched entirely to cardboard. And they also got rid of the plastic um, coated wire ties that would hold their toys in place. And so that's just an example of an innovative way to get away from having so much plastic packaging. And then of course, legislation, making laws. Uh, another example of innovation, one that a lot of people are looking at is, is this. Uh, right now, we have what's pretty much a linear economy where something's made, it's used, and then it goes to the landfill, it goes into the trash. Um, in a recycling economy, something's made, it's used, and then the materials are recycled into something else and they get used again and again. Uh, and ultimately, there is some waste going to the landfill. But a, a circular economy is a vision where there is no waste, where what we create can be reused. So the, the waste from one process becomes a raw material, a resource for another. Uh, so there's many groups that are working on a uh, circular economy. Also, um, in 2014, Virginia was one of the first states, actually we were the second state in the United States and the first on the East Coast to develop a marine debris reduction plan. This plan is a roadmap for schools and churches and um, businesses and governments to reduce the amount of, of marine debris and plastic entering our ocean. Uh, since we did that plan, many other states have plans in place, Florida, Maine, Oregon. Uh, so we are really proud of the leadership that Virginia uh, had on that way back then. Uh, right now, this marine debris plan is being updated and uh, for 2021 through 2025. And it has four major goals, four major buckets that we want to work on. First, the biggest one is single use plastics, which more and more is being called SUP, S-U-P, for single use plastics. Um, and most of this is consumer debris, the things that you and I touch every day. The other three goals that are covered in this reduction plan are um, derelict fishing gear, again, nets and crab pots and fishing line, uh, microplastics and microfibers. Microfibers are the tiny pieces of plastic fibers that come off of our polyester clothing and the other pieces of clothing we have that are made from basically plastics. Um, so there's a lot of new research going on with microplastics and microfibers. And then the fourth big goal of this new plan, this, this updated plan, deals with abandoned boats, which I will talk about in just a minute. And just a reminder, if you have questions that pop in your head as I'm talking, please put them in the chat box. And then when I get done, uh, we'll answer as many questions as we can. So a lot has been happening in Virginia. In addition to writing that marine debris reduction plan, we've also had uh, summits, which have brought together researchers and um, educators and policymakers to talk about what can we do to keep our trash out of the ocean. We've had three so far, and we have another one coming up um, next year in 2022. We've also done some social marketing campaigns. Now, by social marketing, I, I don't mean social media. Social media is like Facebook, Twitter, things like that. But social marketing is a process, a method, where you talk to the people who are doing the behavior that you would like to see change, and you find out from them, from listening to them, what would make them consider changing their behavior. Um, so just like a marketing expert tries to sell you a new car or toothpaste and they research their market, uh, with social marketing, we do the same thing. We, we research the people who are doing the thing that we would like them to not do. In this case, we're talking about intentional releases of balloons. You know, people who buy 
dozens or hundreds of helium filled balloons, take them outside and litter them basically into the air as part of a, a celebration or a ceremony. Um, so we've done this research and um, I thought I'd ask you a pop quiz. So just answer in your own head. Uh, what do you think the answer is to this? What is the number one event during which people release balloons? Do you think it's store openings, sporting events, weddings, memorial events, or fundraising? So think about what your answer is. And actually the answer is memorial events. Um, our research uh, that we did for an entire year by looking at newspaper reports about balloon releases as well as TV um, news casts that talked about balloon releases, we learned that uh, by far most of the balloon releases are in conjunction with memorial services, either at a funeral or a year later, like, oh, it's been a year since we've lost our loved one. Um, and then the rest are pretty much happy -er events. This was another thing we learned in our research. Uh, what percentage of balloon releases are organized by women? What would you guess? 28%, 39, 65%, 83, or 100%? Okay, so you picked your number and the answer is 83. 83% of balloon release events are planned by women according to the research that we've done. So this was really helpful because it told us that any research we did uh, about people who release balloons and what they might do instead, uh, it told us to talk mostly to women. One of the things that we created as a result of this long process uh, was the Joyful Send-Off campaign. And the Joyful Send-Off campaign um, includes this website where we're trying to tell people that there's many ways that they can celebrate, they can have that uh, picture perfect moment at the end of their wedding when uh, the bride and groom or the, the, the married couple are leaving the wedding site and the family and friends can come together and have a picture perfect ending to the wedding day that does not involve litter. Um, I wanna thank too, this uh, research was all done thanks to support from the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program, which uh, took a leadership role really in coordinating marine debris reduction in Virginia. Uh, I mean, there's been a lot of groups working on litter prevention uh, for many years, uh, but the Coastal Zone Management Program um, brought together the summits, they did the, they organized those summits that I talked about, and they also received funding from the NOAA's Marine Debris Program, which supported all of this research um, that I've been talking about, about uh, balloon releases. So uh, very good supporters of this project. Um, it also, all this work led to this website, again, created by the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program, but even though it was organized and created in Virginia, it's actually become an international asset. Uh, we've had um, organizations truly all over the world sign on as supporters for this effort to prevent balloon litter. So please check out this website. Uh, it's www.preventballoonlitter.com. And um, it, it offers all kinds of inspirational ideas for celebrating or having a memorial service, uh, but will not create harmful uh, litter. Funding also from Coastal Zone Management Program helped the development of some videos. Uh, they're animated, as you can see some stills here. They're in English and in Spanish. And um, at the end of this, I can give you the uh, YouTube channel so that you can view these. You can also view them from preventbloomlitter.org. Uh, again, just trying to show people um, that there's lots of great ways to um, celebrate without causing litter. Uh, some other campaigns that you might have heard about are uh, campaigns that are focused on decreasing the use of single-use plastic straws. There's lots of different ones. Uh, the Ocean Conservancy has a program. Uh, there's a new program just starting in Richmond 
uh, focused on uh, restaurants. And uh, the upper right, you see Kick the Straw. That's a campaign that was developed by Clean Virginia Waterways uh, for colleges and high schools. So lots of different efforts to focus on one little tiny thing we can all do to decrease debris in our environment. There's also lots of other programs. I, I won't have time to go through all of them, but I just wanted to show you a few. Um, there's some recycling of fishing line going on. Uh, Virginia Beach has a robust program um, at piers and places where people fish a lot. And actually, we're trying to expand this in the, uh, the months to come. Um, and then there's all kinds of other projects going on. For example, the Mid-Atlantic portal and work group. So there's a work group that meets every month. And by Mid-Atlantic, I mean New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, uh, DC, and Virginia. And we talk about ways that we can all work together because the fact is trash travels litter travels. It doesn't respect boundaries. And so we're trying to find ways that we can all work together. Um, there's also a calendar of events kept by Keep Virginia Beautiful if you're looking for upcoming events. And there's many, many cleanups that are done um, by counties and by soil and water conservation districts. So if you want to get engaged, there's lots of ways that you can. And then finally, um, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but um, the Department of Environmental Quality, that's the Virginia DEQ, has annual grants that they give to communities to um, deal with litter and also increase recycling. And that's all paid for by a, a litter tax in Virginia. So some ways you can get involved. Uh, first of all, Litter Free Virginia is a website that helps you keep track of what policies and what laws are being considered by the state government. Um, so during the General Assembly sessions, you can go on here every day and learn what bills have been brought up and where they are. Are they dying in committee or are they not dying in committee? And there's also some tips on ways you can reach out to your elected delegates or senators to tell them what you think about these bills and uh, what support you hope that they will give. Um, there's also a group, it's only been around for a little less than a year, the Virginia Plastic Pollution Prevention Network. This network is made up so far, I think there's about 105 partners, uh, but it's made up of organizations that are working to reduce plastic pollution. They have monthly uh, webinars, they're free. Um, and also they have a website with forums so that you can share and you can ask questions like, hey, does anyone know about uh, resources that would help me with this problem or that problem? So uh, please check that out. And it is free to become a member of that. Also, um, I mentioned earlier some data that was collected by volunteers. Um, and I wanted to let you know that we also provide these reports where we take all the data. Uh, now, some of our reports are really long, like 70 pages, lots of details. But we also have these short ones that are two or three pages that just give you, in a nutshell, the big picture um, about what the data says. That first report on the left, uh, we took a look at how many bottles and cans are littered in Virginia. And then we compare that with states that have bottle bills, bills where um, if you buy a soda or beer in country or in cities and uh, states that have bottle bills, you pay a five or 10 cent deposit. Then when you return the bottle or the can, you get your deposit back. And this has proven to decrease litter uh, significantly. So that's our report that shows that. So if you want to get involved and do cleanups and collect data, uh, we would be so thankful because we do put the data to work. Another program that um, is, uh, we started in the Virginia Beach area, um, and this is a program of Clean Virginia Waterways, but it has many, many partners. Uh, the Virginia Beach um, hospitality industry has 
really helped out with this as well as the Virginia Aquarium and again the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program. So it's many partners working together to reach beach visitors. Uh, we're trying to reach beach visitors everywhere where they sleep, they eat, they are on the beach with messages um, about not littering and doing the right thing. There's also um, a lot of activity trying to keep our litter and our trash out of storm drains. So if you see a piece of litter on a parking lot or a sidewalk or a road, next time it rains, there's a good chance that piece of plastic litter is gonna go down a storm drain. And storm drains are connected to creeks and rivers and bays for the most part. There's a few exceptions, but for the most part, litter will be going right into streams. Uh, so we've actually built a partnership uh, and we have annual workshops for stormwater managers to talk about options that um, they can implement in their towns to keep plastic um, out of their waterways. There's another way, once trash unfortunately has made it into a river or a stream, there are trash traps that can uh, stop plastic trash from moving to the next body of water. Here is a trash trap that was installed in Fairfax County last year. And um, they are though expensive. This one cost over half a million dollars to install. That included buying the trash trap and then all of the work that had to be done on both sides of the bank and all the infrastructure that had to be put in place to make this work. And then every time it rains, that trash trap has to be emptied. Uh, so that takes a lot of manpower, a lot of um, people power, I should say. So uh, it's possible to stop trash from making it to the Chesapeake Bay or the ocean by doing this, but you can see the high cost to our society. There are also smaller ways to um, trash, to trap trash. This is a sea bin. These sea bins, uh, as you can see from the middle picture, are the size of a big bucket, and that's a mesh that goes into a colander. Um, these do require electricity. Uh, electricity runs a little pump to pull water gently into the sea bin, and anything that's floating along the surface will also end up in the sea bin, and then the sea bin has to be emptied on a regular basis. These are best in areas like docks and marinas where there's not a like, uh, high action, high wave action. And there's um, a, a, about a dozen of these in Virginia and uh, more coming in the next year, we hope. So I mentioned a little bit about cleanups, uh, excuse me, <laughs> have allergies. Um, there's many different cleanups going on in Virginia. Some are statewide, like the Great American Cleanup, which is every spring, and that's organized by Keep Virginia Beautiful, Adopt a Highway, which you probably have heard about, and then the International Coastal Cleanup, which is organized by Clean Virginia Waterways, and that's every fall. So that's coming up, so I hope you sign up. There's also many regional cleanups as well as local events. So again, please, please get involved. It's um, a great feeling at the end of an hour or two of picking up debris to see what you did, to see how much cleaner the environment is because of you. So I encourage you to, um, to, to get your family and friends out and, and participate. So the International Coastal Cleanup, um, it will be this August through November. And so far we've had uh, over 116,000 volunteers over the last 26 years. And they've picked up 4.8 million pounds of debris. But they not only pick up the debris, they also collect data. And here's a sample of the data card. Uh, we have the cardboard card, which uh, you can download off of our website or we'll mail some to you. And there's also an app that you can put on your smartphone uh, and you can collect data that way. But either way, the data all go into the same database, which is online and open to anybody. It's a free international online database. So you can find out what is the biggest problem where you live, in your county or in your town. 
So there's another um, bit of work that I wanted to talk to you about, um, and that is abandoned and derelict vessels. These are basically boats uh, that people dispose of in the environment, and they end up being an impact on um, not only the environment, but they're real navigational hazards. I mean, if, think about it. If you are out on a boat and there is a, a boat that has been abandoned, it's got no lights on it, it's just floating along, it could be a real navigational hazard to you. There also are um, hazardous materials, hazmats, potentially on these boats like oil and, and, and gasoline and such. Um, so there's there are a lot of impacts to this. And uh, on the coast, the issue is commercial as well as recreational. Uh, for example, in the upper right, that's a, a photo of a um, fishing boat that I took on an island um, off of Virginia, uh, Cedar Island. And uh, when it started to sink, the owner called the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard came out, took off all the oil and gas and uh, hazardous materials. Um, but the boat is there and it's been there for years um, because it's very, very, very expensive to uh, dispose of these vessels correctly. But it's not just a coastal issue, it's also a, an issue uh, in freshwater in habitats, um, including lakes like uh, Lake Anna and Lake Gaskin and uh, Smith Mountain Lake. Um, so there is a group we're meeting to come up with recommendations on how to fix that problem. There's also issues with uh, fishing gear, as I mentioned earlier. This is a, a crab pot. And when these crab pots become severed from their floats, so these crab pots are on the, the, the bottom of the, the bay to catch crabs, and they're connected by a rope to a float. And when that float becomes severed, like a boat went over and, and cut it, or if there's a storm sometimes, uh, these crab pots can remain down there and they can continue to catch animals uh, for a very long time. So there's a lot of great research being done on solutions to that. Another issue that's rather unique to Virginia are uh, clam nets. So uh, Virginia is actually one of the top producers of clams through aquaculture, where the clams are grown in certain plots. And the little cl clams are protected from predators with these large nets. I mean, you can see our volunteers in the upper left there. Um, they've got their hands filled. These, these nets can be 40 feet or more in length. And they are, um, they're kind of like the nets that you put on blueberries to keep birds away. So they are plastic and um, they wash up after storms. And so Coastal Zone Management Program is working with clam growers to come up with solutions to this problem. And we're looking for ways to possibly get these nets recycled. Uh, I wanted to talk briefly about some research that's being done. Um, this project went on for uh, four years and four months where Virginia Aquarium and the other partners you see down there um, monitored four different sites in Virginia monthly. Yes, once a month for four years and four months, our trained volunteers went out to these four sites to do research and studies. So here's another pop quiz for you. According to that four years of monthly surveys, what percentage of debris on the beaches is made of plastic? So we collected data. What percent was made out of plastic? What would you guess? Well, the answer is 83% was made out of plastic. And the rest was made out of various other materials. So again, that's one of the reasons we focus on this problem. There is also this great research uh, that was done by Christina uh, Trapani, who is uh, a, a longtime marine debris researcher, and Kathy O'Hara, um, both from Virginia Beach. They went out to those islands, uh, Smith Hog, Fisherman, Cedar, and False Cape, uh, and did research on looking at the balloon litter. It turns out, and this is data that came from our volunteers during the International Coastal Cleanup, if you go out and do a cleanup in your backyard, 
you may not find a balloon, a, you know, a helium filled balloon that landed in your backyard. Uh, but it turns out that they show up a lot on beaches. That's because they travel through the wind and then they land in the water and then the waves and, and wind bring them to shore. And so we looked at the data that our volunteers collected and decided to go deeper. And so Kathy and Christina went to these islands and collected lots and lots of data. They take a photo of every single balloon and every single ribbon that they find. And we, uh, we all did a cleanup uh, and survey on Easter Sunday. Um, that was one of the only days that the tides worked out for our schedule. And we found more than 200 pieces of balloons and ribbons in just half a mile. So this really is a problem that's accumulating on our coasts. So another um, issue that I mentioned just briefly earlier was microplastics and microfibers. And this is a fascinating new world of research that's going on. Uh, scientists are trying to understand what are the quantities of microplastics, not just in the ocean, and in the Chesapeake Bay and in our rivers, but even in our homes, uh, we spend most of our lives indoors and there are microfibers and microplastics in our homes. Uh, researchers are also um, looking at the impact that these uh, microplastics have on all kinds of natural communities. Uh, so if you're interested in that, this is a, a brand new world of uh, understanding this type of, of water pollution. So I mentioned earlier that uh, laws uh, are one way that we can modify our consumption, modify our use of items, including some plastics. Um, and I also mentioned earlier a uh, Virginia tax that we have uh, for, on litter. Now, who pays this? Actually, the uh, Virginia litter tax is paid by businesses that sell sodas and beer. It's more complicated than that, but roughly, if you're a, a 7-Eleven or a Walmart, you pay this fee. And it's been $10 since 1970, since the 1970s when the, the bill was first passed. Just last year, it was raised from $10 to $20. Um, so this bill uh, was a step in the right direction. Uh, and all of the money from this Virginia litter tax goes out to local governments. It goes out to county governments and towns to decrease litter and, um, and marine debris and increase recycling. Uh, many of us feel that it's still too low for the need. So there is some discussion about um, increasing it so that we have more money to deal with. Basically, the Virginia litter tax right now raises less than $4 million. And that's divided by, again, all the, the county and local governments. Um, another new law that's going to take effect in just a few weeks is it will be illegal in Virginia as of July 1 to intentionally release helium-filled balloons into the environment. Um, and we're hoping that this law will educate people that, well, yes, it's illegal, but it's also wrong. It's, it's basically litter. Um, so that's why we're hoping that the preventbloomlitter.org website will give people ideas on other things they can do. And then also polystyrene uh, food containers are going to be phased out. Those are, people often call them styrofoam, but it's uh, polystyrene. So those will be phased out in Virginia. And also, local governments now have the ability to put a five cent fee on plastic bags. Um, and plastic bags are a big part of our litter. This chart shows, so everything in dark blue is made out of pl uh, plastic. This is data, again, from our volunteers. And you see the big box there in the middle are plastic grocery bags. So plastic grocery bags are a big part of our litter here in Virginia and it's going up. The, this is our data since uh, 1995, and you see that dotted line shows that we are getting more and more plastic bags littered in Virginia. If you're interested in learning more about how your community can add a fee to plastic bags, take a look at our website, um, longwood.edu slash cleanva slash bags.
www.ethicsmarketing.html. And uh, you'll see a lot of data there about how big a problem this is. Um, Okay, I already covered that. Uh, also in March, our governor passed an executive order or declared an executive order, number 77, which will decrease the use of plastic bags, uh, single-use plastic food service containers, straws, plastic forks, and single-use water bottles from state agencies. And this includes universities. So college students going to a state university in uh, uh, later next semester will find these things not on their campus. There's also policies that, that uh, can be put in place. They're not laws, but they're policies. Like many schools have rules and policies against the use of glitter, because glitter is basically tiny, tiny plastic with metallic um, colors on it. Um, many state parks have uh, policies in place against balloon releases and against the releasing of sky lanterns. Uh, businesses, more and more businesses are saying, you know, our restaurant will only serve paper straws and only on request. Uh, so it's another way that we can all work together. And I know the Norfolk Botanical Garden uh, for many years have, has taken active steps to reduce single-use plastic in their gardens and in their um, with their vendors. Uh, and then finally, I wanna share some, some artwork that people have come up with to help educate people. These are, are big butts. These cigarette butts are about two feet long and they're made out of P, PCB, you know, or P, poly, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but pipes, pipes, plastic pipes that uh, you might see in home construction. And they have a, a little webinar, a uh, little YouTube on how you can make these. And then they take them around the community uh, to show people that cigarette butts are litter too. And then this uh, huge turtle, this turtle is like seven feet from tail to head. And uh, it looks kind of pretty, but those, what's filling the, that turtle, it's a metal frame. And those are all balloons and ribbons that were found uh, by our researchers. Uh, 11,000 balloons and ribbons uh, were uh, part of the sculpture. And then here's a sculpture of a whale. This is in the Shenandoah Valley and it visits schools. It goes from school to school and the, the, it comes with an educational campaign and uh, the, the students pick up plastic litter that they find and put it in the whale as a demonstration of just how uh, much plastic litter there is out there and what we can do about it. So uh, I encourage you to check out the Virginia Plastic Pollution Prevention Network. Um, a lot, the website's you know, free, it's got a lot of good information. Um, and if you are a member of a group or a church or a business that is working on plastic pollution prevention, you can become a member. Um, also, the um, Virginia Marine Debris Reduction Plan is open for comments for one more week, just one more week. So again, if you're part of a group that's committed to uh, reducing marine debris in our ocean, um, my email is on the last slide and I encourage you to reach out to me and I'll send you the link so you can read it and sign up as a partner. We're looking for groups to sign up to partner with us to handle this issue. And finally, this is super cool. Uh, next month, um, the afternoons of July 20, 21, and 22, there's going to be a Marine Debris Summit. It's free, it's online. It's gonna be 12.30 to five, each of those three days. And we've got some fantastic speakers, uh, researchers, educators, policy makers. We've got some senators, hopefully, that will be joining us. And we're gonna take a deeper dive into what people are doing to solve these problems. Um, so Mid-Atlantic Marine Debris Summit. And again, that's free. And I did mention we'll have a Virginia Marine Debris Summit in May or June of 2022. Um, so if you, keep, uh, if you like Clean Virginia Waterways on Facebook, uh, or if you're a member of the Virginia Plastic Pollution Prevention Network, you'll hear about that and how to sign up. So I'm gonna end with this, one of my favorite quotes, how inappropriate to call this planet Earth when clearly it is ocean. 
in fact, 71% of our planet is covered with water and it's uh, our job to take care of it. So um, I thank you for your attention. There's my contact information. If you wanna know more about some of the things I've said, um, please reach out to me by email or check out our website. So at this point, I guess I'll see if there's any questions. Yes, so it does look like we have some questions here. I'll just go ahead and read them out to you. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first question that we have, uh, Brian Alexander asks, can you give an example of a plastic object or type that can have a circular, e or circular economy? Yeah, that one's, um, so when we recycle uh, our plastic bottles, they don't get, come back to being plastic bottles. Um, many plastics do get recycled, but they get downcycled. They get recycled into something simpler uh, or something um, that doesn't have quite as many requirements, like plastic bottles for sodas have to have a certain standard of color and flexibility and things like that. Um, I guess one of the best examples would be when single-use plastic items get recycled into something that's not single-use. For example, shopping bags and all plastic film like a bread a bag that you buy bread in and things like that all that plastic film can be recycled and it gets recycled into decking and um like picnic benches and park benches and things like that so it's um taking a single use thing and making it a non-single use um so that's the best i can do quickly but it's a, it's a great question because recycling plastics, uh, first of all, we don't have a great infrastructure here in the United States for recycling plastics. Um, and much of what we do, it's downcycling, not upcycling. So I hope that helps. All right, we have another, this one's more of a comment, if we could get you to just clarify on it. Um, Kristen Casey uh, commented that she thought balloon re or releases were illegal, if we could just have you clarify that potentially. Yes, so in the state of Virginia, for many years, Balloon releases of 50, five zero or more have been illegal in Virginia for many years. But starting July 1 of this year, all intentional balloon releases will be illegal with the exception of researchers like doing weather balloon releases. So it, it was, it's, I mean, today it's legal in Virginia to release up to 49 balloons, but as of July 1, that will not be legal. All right, thank you. We have another one. Uh, how, let's see, from Linda Bowman. How much research is being done on replacing plastic with organic plastic? I read something about food wrap being made out of sugar syrup. Can anything be done about the floating garbage islands? So it's a couple, two part question. I can go back and repeat that if you like. Well, um, first of all, let's talk about bioplastics or biodegradable plastics. Um, yes, there's lots of research going on. Um, one of the issues, well, a lot, a lot of times these are also called compostable plastics. And those plastics need a commercial composter. Um, so it's not like you can use a biodegradable plastic plate, compostable plastic plate, and put it in your backyard with some leaves on it. Um, we need commercial composting where the heat, the temperature are all uh, monitored. And actually there's a call for more of those. There is a um, commercial composting place near uh, Williamsburg. And there's many of us that think Virginia could have several of these. And then that will make it easier for schools, universities, prisons, uh, amusement parks to switch over to those biodegradable uh, and compostable plastics. And the second question I already forgot. Yep. <laughs> the second question uh, would be, can anything be done about the floating garbage islands? Uh, ah. Kind of a broad one. Yes. Uh, there are some people who believe we could go out there, capture it, but most of the oceanographers I know say that that is a, a pipe dream, that the power of the ocean you know, the waves, the storms, um, that's not feasible. And so most people believe what we've got to do is turn off the faucet. And the faucet is the amount of plastic that we're using and creating, but also most of the plastic entering the ocean comes from the rivers. 
And so there's more and more energy being spent stopping the plastic in the rivers before it gets out into the ocean. Uh, because the Pacific Ocean is basically half of the planet Earth. If you look at a globe a certain way, you don't you can hardly see any land. That's the Pacific Ocean. So to go out there and pick it up, it's um, I, I believe that's not feasible. I think we need to spend our time, money, and uh, brilliance um, stopping it from getting in the in the rivers to begin with. And then let's see. We have some kudos to you for this program. Uh, we definitely agree. Thank you for putting this together. Uh, I just like this one. I'm going to call it out from Kristen Casey that she has some yoga pants made from a uh, percentage of recycled plastic. Uh, and then let's see. Last question we have here. Brian Alexander asks, is the plastic fee for places like 7-Eleven a fee of $20 a year? Doesn't seem like a lot. Could you clarify potentially on the plastic fees? Right. So the Virginia litter tax um, and it's more nuanced than I have time to go into, but basically, yes, every 7-Eleven, every Walmart, every Kroger's uh, has been paying $10 a year since the 1970s for the litter tax. If that litter tax had been indexed to inflation, if it had grown with inflation, that tax would be 40 some dollars per business. Um, which still sounds to me, you know, like I think most Walmarts could afford $40 a year. Um, now, obviously, if you own seven uh, 7-Elevens, you're paying that fee times seven, um, but it is pretty low. In fact, I was just last week, I looked up Washington State also has a litter tax, which is also paid by businesses who sell bottles and cans, and their litter tax is raising $11 million dollars a year to combat litter and ours is less than 4 million and their population is smaller than ours. So I, I think there's a, a good solid argument that um, that tax could be raised and really benefit. Also, since the seventies, our population has grown and since the seventies, the amount of single use plastic um, has really grown. I mean, those of you who are older might remember when we were younger people, there was no such things as buying a bottle of water. That's that's a rather recent phenomenon. So yeah, that. Um, but if you just type in Virginia litter tax, you can learn more about the nuance of of that law. And then, um, just a quick follow up to that one. We do have a question. Uh, you know, off the top of your head, do ABC stores have to pay that tax as well? What a great question! I should know the answer, and I do not. Well, this is great because you gave us the information where we can go and look it up. So thank you for that. Um, okay. it looks like I'm that, find it too. <laughs> it looks like that wraps up. Oh, I do have one question I missed. Let's see. Um, I've read that we, the United States, compact our trash and send it to countries which have the least effective trash management systems. Is this true? Yes. For years and years and years that uh, we were sending it to China. Then three years ago, China said, we're going to stop taking the world's plastics. We are still exporting plastics uh, a lot to Asia. Um, and I wish I could share real quickly with you this resource I saw just the other day, uh, but there is a group that is tracking uh, how much of our plastic waste we are sending to other countries. And many of those countries do not have adequate infrastructure. Um, so it's a problem we have created uh, plastic because it's convenient and it's inexpensive and mostly it's convenient uh, and um, we've not developed at the same time a way to deal with it and so it's going into our landfills um, in fact governor's EO 77 which I mentioned earlier executive order 77 part of the reason that he gave for that isn't just to reduce the amount of plastic litter in Virginia, but it's also concern about our landfills. Uh, landfills are expensive. Um, and do we really want to just keep filling them with, with plastic? So um, it's a solid waste issue. It's a stormwater issue. It's a behavior change issue. It's a climate change issue because plastics come from, uh, for the most part, fossil fuels. So, um, it's a big issue, but I really think it's solvable 
And what I really like about it is even the youngest people, the youngest person can make decisions about, you know, not using a single use uh, lunch bag, but instead getting a, a lunch bag that they're gonna use every day for a year. Um, the youngest people can pick up debris. And if they've got a smartphone, they can download an app to collect. So it, it's all, but we just have to have the willpower to do it. Well, thank you so much for uh, your time tonight. Uh, looks like that is all the questions. Um, okay. With that, thank you guys for joining us and uh, tuning into such an important program. And uh, please check back throughout the summer. Uh, we are offering other free programs as well of a similar um, strain of topic. So again, thank you all um, for joining us tonight. And thank you, uh, Katie, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate your time.